Hello and welcome to the Skylander Spirit Adventure Developer Commentary. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to the lead game designer, Toby Shad. Yeah, I had to think back because I've kind of done different things on the different Skylanders games, but um, back then, uh, it's, it's worthy of note that all of the kind of game functionality was written more or less by designers using our in-house scripting language. So from the get-go, uh, our programmer team has done a great job creating tools for designers to use. But um, what's cool about uh, designers sort of implementing the game via scripting language is that there's it's less of a game of telephone, so we could put our ideas into the game in a fairly direct manner. So from, from the outset, uh, designers were uh, prototyping our kind of our first vision of what the game was. So that was kind of the first role was a small, a small number of us just tried to put together a prototype of, uh, you know, the basic kind of action adventure gameplay and uh, trying to answer questions like, what's the camera? What's the combat like? Uh, what are the challenges like for the player over the course of the level? You know, how, what's the tone of the game? Uh, so at, at that point in time, we weren't really, uh, super diversified into different roles a, a small number of us were just all sort of heads heads together trying to put cool ideas on screen as as the game went on i got more involved in the actual skylander power implementation so uh eway and paul ritchie were the two main people who were coming up with uh you know what would the skylanders look like uh as toys, you know, because uh, first and foremost, um, the character, uh, more, uh, in a different way than any game we'd made previously, these games had to be, or these characters had to be able to look good on the shelf, which was a, an interesting new challenge. So our character design team had to uh, kind of start with a character that had already been imagined and then figure out what that character's powers were. So over time, uh, that Skylander team, we kind of, you know, honed the model for like how many attacks Skylanders would have. Um, what does the upgrade tree look like for for the skills for the attacks? Um, and those questions were a big part of uh, my focus for Spyro's adventure. Uh, that said, I also had a hand in like uh, scripting up our combat systems. Uh, enemy creation to some extent uh, and we, we were a pretty small team then so on the design team a lot of us uh, contributed in a lot of different areas which was really fun. So you mentioned uh, the in-house scripting language, when was that created? Was it specifically made for Skylanders or was it before then? It wasn't actually and that that's a great thing because when development tools come online they typically uh aren't as user-friendly at the beginning. That's usually an evolution that happens over a number of years. The first iteration of the, the Toys for Bob scripting language was, uh, believe it or not, in the last millennium, uh, we used a version of it for uh, 102 Dalmatians, Puppies to the Rescue. I think that was the first official title that had it. Now, that wasn't, uh, it wasn't exactly the same uh, because, uh, but, but, but the basic, the basic ideas and approach to the way designers would create content. Um, that was kind of the first iteration of that language. Uh, and then we, we used it for uh, both of the Madagascar games and then for all but the all but Imaginators in terms of the Toys for Bob Skylanders games. So what was great is that it was it was a pretty mature language by the time you know, in 2009, 2010, uh, that we were making Skylanders, it was it was really fun to use and powerful. And why did it change uh, for Imaginators? Did it just evolve? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we, as as you and probably all the fans are aware, um, Vicarious Visions did uh, what they did three of the Skylanders games. Is that right? We did four. They did three. They did uh, Swap Force, Superchargers, and what was the third? I think it was just those two, wasn't it? 
it was two. Maybe you're right. We did uh, Spyro's Adventure, Giants, Trap Team, and Imaginators. So we were effectively trading off games with them. And what was happening is that because each game had uh, so many new Skylanders, like usually I think Giants was the fewest Skylanders that we had, right? Were there 16 in that game? Does that sound right? 16 uh, new maybe. Skylanders? Maybe. I'm not sure. I've... Not including, not including variants. So so what we were... Yeah. What, happening was that vicarious visions had their own development tool so every time the new company would or sort of the company working on the current game would start they had to re-implement all of the skylanders that the other team had done in the previous game in in their development tool so every time we traded off we, we effectively had to do uh work that had already been done but in a different tool because we weren't sharing tool sets so, so finally, by, by the time Imaginators rolled around, we sort of got wise and started using Vicarious Vision's development tool, which was also um, a great tool in its own right. Wow, so for stuff like Trap Team, you would have had to recreate the Skylanders that were in the Swap Force. Yes, and maybe the biggest challenge was uh, for Swap Force, they had to recreate the 32 original... Wow. Uh, and that was one of the, I mean, one of the incredible things, I think, in terms of uh, just a, a fan-friendly gesture, like having each game support all of the legacy Skylanders was a really important priority mm. for us. And it did become, as you might imagine, as, you know, as the years go by and more and more Skylanders stack up, it becomes a lot of work to maintain. And uh, it would be interesting if we were still making Skylanders games, how, I mean, how many would there be? And we were, we were yeah. well into the already. I mean, that's I, I I had no idea. You both companies don't get enough credit for what you did in that regard. Like that's, I mean, especially with as as more Skylanders came about. But I mean, with Swap Force, like there's the whole switching mechanic. That's so much work. Like, how much? How long did that take to recreate that? Well, you know, we were kind of bound by we shipped a product every year, so you figure. Uh, I guess we were at the time we were alternating uh, years so effectively each game had two years with the exception of giants and i would say for the f the first game our dev cycle was a little bit longer because we you know because we had, had to come up with the basic idea and implement all the tech for the portal and the skylanders um so you know the better part of two years i guess it, it's hard. It's kind of hard to quantify uh, person work units uh, in retrospect, but it was a lot of work. Wow, I I tip my hat to all of you. That's amazing. <laughs> that is that is incredible work. Um, so you said that you uh, worked uh, to some enemy creation. Was that actually coming up with the design, or actually what the enemy would be, or you know, what what exactly was it that you were doing with them? Yeah. Um, as I was talking about, the kind of design constraints for Skylanders were different because the it was such a toy-forward product. Um, that wasn't so much the case with enemies, so a designer could dream up an enemy. In fact, I was uh, looking at some videos this morning, looking at uh, the spider level, which I... It's funny. All the levels get their... And Skylanders get their official names for the... Uh, for the ship title, and it's what's funny is usually during development you have your own internal names. Uh, later on, uh, I can go over some of the development names that we had for the different Skylanders because some of them were, were kind of funny. I think. Yeah, I'd love I guess that. In the crawling catacombs is mm -hmm. what I was looking at this morning, and I was looking at the if you recall the spiders with the giant. Uh, what is the what's the uh, what's a nice way to describe it? They were just sacks full of pus that they would sort <laughs> of pour it onto the ground, and it would be a big poisonous hazard that you had to avoid. And then they would slurp it back up. Do you remember this enemy? Yeah, yeah. I, it was I, delightful. I'm pretty sure that that came from the head of a uh, a designer who described that uh, to one of our concept artists, and uh, it, it came to pass in all of its glory. So yeah, that's the, uh, a lot of fun to create something like that. It's just like oh, I get to scare children, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it's it's funny as as the game development industry uh, sort of 
matures in general too. In, in a way, there's less. In some respects, there's less creative freedom because the job roles do get more diversified.、Uh, if that makes sense, or there's more separation of roles than maybe there was even even during that time. So, whereas now you might have a concept team. That goes off and designs all the enemies for a game.、Um, it's nice when you. It's nice when there's close collaboration between the design team and the concept team. So we we do still try to keep that going. But back then it was even more organic. I'd say. You worked、uh, within the、uh, PVP mode, didn't you? Yes. Yes.、Um, what、uh, What exactly、uh, did you do for the PVP? Yeah. Well, it's a good question.、Um, the Kind of the very beginning of Toys for Bob,、uh, there were two、um, fairly well-known in certain circles、uh, PC games, Star Control and Star Control Two, and they had a mode known as、uh, Super Melee, and that was a, a local PVP、um, P- PVP mode that was sort of laid the groundwork for a lot of. What Toys for Bob would do with local PVP for a variety of different games, including so a little-known、uh, PlayStation One title called Unholy War, which kind of had small arenas and、um, teams of heroes、uh, that had kind of asymmetric power sets. So,、um, in any given battle, there kind of the, the Toys for Bob guarantee isn't that. This Skylander versus this Skylander would necessarily be of equal power, but because there there are these giant rosters of characters that you can pit against one another, it becomes interesting when you're battling over a series of PVP fights. So for Skylanders, we kind of followed that model, and、um, I think from the outset, we just as a studio, we've always loved that local PVP experience, and so we kind of followed that. Same formula that started with Star Control was evolved a little bit in Unholy War.、Uh, small arenas,、um, bounce pads, and teleporters that help to move you around the map.、Um, and what was the work? I mean, the work was designing the arenas, testing the arenas,、uh, and then w- one of the tasks that really scared us was how will we possibly、um, get. Get these, get all the Skylanders balanced. And as I was hinting at a minute ago, at a certain point, you, you let that go when you have roster a roster of heroes that's that's thirty two characters, and then for giants, you know, it was forty eight characters. And I think that that process of discovery for players, kind of figuring out who's strong against who, which attacks are successful, just made for an interesting.、Um, An interesting experience for players. What was your experience like playing PvP? Yeah, it was a lot of fun.、Um, I haven't actually gone back and replayed it for the series yet. I plan on doing that、uh, at some point soon. But yeah, I remember really enjoying it because my biggest problem was I、uh, all of my friends went off to uni, <laughs> so I didn't have anyone to play with.、Um, right. So it was just like it was very sporadic when I ever could.、Um, but it was a lot of fun. I, I enjoyed uh, trying. Uh, Different skylanders to see what、uh, was better and worse. Obviously, some were more powerful than others. Others,、uh, some were、uh, quicker. So it was just like, okay, I'm, I may not have the power, but I have the speed to dodge and just try and work out a strategy to take them down. It was just, it was always, it was always fun because it was always very much like a, it wasn't always a brute force kind of scenario, which,、uh, which some games can fall into the trap of.、Um, right. Was, there was there was a strategy behind how I had to. To move around the arena, which I liked. Was the PVP mode always planned from the beginning, or did it just come up at some point, like midway through? I can say I'm pretty sure, given that that, that local PVP is sort of is sort of like in the Toys for Bob DNA. As I recall, it was it was slated to be part of the game for、uh, from just about the beginning. Yeah. And did、uh, were there any plans for it to have?、Uh, Like to be any different than it ended up being, or was it was it always pretty much like that? That core DNA it just stayed similar throughout. I would say you know we we did d- decide to add、uh, some additional modes at some point along the way, and we ended up with the so-called Sky Goals and Sky Gem Master. And、uh, other than that, you know, we did 
it was a formula that that worked. I don't think I don't think we felt like it was absolutely perfect for everyone. Um, it was disappointing when it was uh, I'm trying to remember which game was the first game that didn't have it. If it was Trap Team or I'm pretty sure Swap Force supported PVP, so perhaps it was Trap Team. But I think at that point, I think it was determined that it just wasn't popular enough among the player base given all of the other things we had to accomplish um, as happens and it's unfortunate but as often happens in development you have to pick you know w what is going to be most valuable to our to the greatest number of players and so at a certain point we we stop supporting it but it's still uh, you know i think we we look back on it fondly and it's it's frequent too. You look back. I look back on Skylanders PvP. I'm sure there are some things we could have improved upon it, but there's always sort of like a you often have a ship date, and at a certain point you have to you have to mutually agree to stop working on something, and uh, so that's always an interesting challenge to be able to let go of something that you you might feel like isn't perfect, um, if that makes sense. Mm, yeah, of course. Uh, so do you have a favorite chapter from the first Skylanders? Yeah, I've been thinking about that a little bit. Looking back, um, there were a couple levels that... Um, one that just always felt elegant to me. Um, our lead level designer, Mike Ebert, created the Mulkin Mine. And that was the... You're saving Mulkins, and I believe you're, um, you're clearing out the... The big giant gems so that you can uh, you end up having to drive one of the Mulkin back to the start of the level uh by clearing off the tracks and that that level uh i don't know there was just an elegance about it that i really appreciated it's fairly small and compact but it still felt like a full experience uh, and then the other one that that stood out to me recently looking back was the crawling catacombs and i think primarily just because of the uh the uh, heavy dose of um, spiders and all of the different types of spiders and sort of the surprise element of them dropping in on you. Uh, those were two. What, what are your favorites, Teal? Uh, I really like Stormy Stronghold. Um, uh -huh. I, I think that that was just like a, it's a very, very beautiful place, um, you know, amidst the destruction. Uh, and it was just a, like a really just fun, exciting adventure that uh, that, that chapter took me on. I also, uh, I like the treetop levels, um, it was, uh, treetop terrace, and, uh, I think the other one is falling forest, um, that, they were, uh, they were really fun, um, yep. I, I really like the, the DLC levels as well, I don't know which one of my favourite, I haven't replayed them yet, but I really, I remember really enjoying them, um, yeah, I'd like to play those again too. Yeah, there were some really cool characters within them as well. I was uh, hoping maybe one day, like, oh, maybe some of them will return one day, and they just never did. It's like, oh, it's a shame. There was one highlight in uh, another another aspect of crawling catacombs that I remember was uh, the character of T-Bone was always one of my favorites, and seeing him climb up the kind of spiral vertebrae staircase at the end of the level, um, some things only happen in Skylands, and that's one. A skeleton climbing up a vertebrae staircase. Mm -hmm. Has it been done before in the game? I'm not sure. Uh, so, do you have a favorite Skylander? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. It's sort of like uh, choosing your favorite child. Yeah. You know, it's not something you <laughs> want to do. Um, but, you know... Um, but since I'm going to make you... <laughs> I've kind of always had a, a soft spot for, um, for Chop Chop. Um, and... Uh, you know, in terms of the the characters that I worked on personally, I really liked uh, Ghost Rester. As I recall, when he went, when you went into invulnerable mode as Ghost Rester, I believe you slowly lost health as well, and that was one of the a mechanic that we were a little nervous about because a lot of Skylanders players, um, I, I should say, it's a game that embraces the tries to embrace the casual player, and so any move that uh, you opt into that makes you lose health is sort of uh, a little bit scary as a designer, but I think he was a cool character in that way. I mean, the list the list really goes on and on. Because um, that I liked. Um, I, I liked Slam Bam a lot. 
the surfboard when you took him into the water. Just little touches like that that our designers uh, that you know put a little extra sweat in order to uh, stump smash. When he would walk into the water, he would he would lie prone, right, and float. And this, those little moments like that um, really, I think, help to define uh, the the tone and the just the just the love for all the details that our our designers and artists put into it. Did you? Uh, you I might be wrong about this. You worked on Sonic Boom. I did work on Sonic Boom. Yeah. Yeah, Sonic Boom is a personal favorite of mine. Um, did she start out different at all, or was it always sort of like that? It, she ended up how she sort of started out. Yeah, I worked on her with a with another designer, Adrian Letta. Also worked on her, and I, I chatted with him this morning about her, and he reminded me that uh, we we believe that at at, it, at one point in time. Your babies sort of didn't grow up on their own. You had to actively feed them in order to make them grow and gain power. And so that was, uh, I'm pretty sure she always, uh, you know, created eggs that hatched. She always created babies. I think that was always kind of the core shtick um, behind her. Her her code name, by the way, was just the Griffin. Adrian also pointed out that that she was initially she was colored brown and, and then only later came to be blue. And I'm sure that was a decision that was probably thought to be a more attractive toy as as blue for whatever reason. Mm. That makes sense of why it was the Griffin. Right, right. So, uh, what was your favorite part of development? Um, and I guess this could apply to any of the games. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's also a really tough question. You know, every development cycle has a lot of ups and downs. Um, I would say one of the scarier moments was when we found out that uh, during the development of Spyro's Adventure, before we knew that it was going to be a successful game, we heard that the first run of toys, the first sort of printing of these toys that would come to life was going to be they were going to make 15 million of them and at that point it becomes uh uh it's sort of an all-in bet as far as activision was concerned so the pressure was certainly felt within the studio that, that we really needed to make a great game uh so that was sort of uh i, I wouldn't necessarily call that a one of my favorite moments in development but it was definitely uh memorable what else um there there were moments there was another great moment that i had after release of the game and this again this is every time you especially with a a new ip every as a designer when the game comes out you're really uh, nervously awaiting to see what the response is from critics and fans and i recall one time i was standing outside um in the yard and saw some kids walking down the street um and overheard their conversation and they were talking about Skylanders and that was like a high moment as a designer just to hear kids they were maybe in the eight to ten year old range just talking about your game and I I didn't interrupt them I was tempted to say hey did you know I worked on that game and we made it right here in Novato California but uh that's the kind of thing that makes it all worthwhile um probably the first time we got uh actual toys to play with in the studio during development, which is probably fairly late in development. That was a high moment because before we were just using these uh, generic little like coin shaped RFID chips. (laughs) So you you, you had to kind of uh, use your imagination to, to, uh, to get the toys to life feeling because they weren't actually toys at that point. Yeah. It's, it's, it's definitely fun looking back. I mean, every time eway would, come to us with a new batch of Skylanders. That was always fun to see what we were going to be working on next. That's amazing. I, like, I, I mean, like overhearing people, not kids, especially talking about how much they love something you put so much effort and care into. It's yeah, That must be such an incredible feeling. It is. It's nice now. In, in the early days, like I mentioned, uh, that 102 Dalmatians game that we shipped, I think, in... Might have been 99... Uh, the internet was young enough then too that 
you couldn't, and our audience was younger too, so you really couldn't get any fan feedback. So you send these games out into the world and, you know, you might get the odd letter to your studio, you know, someone who has the, uh, you know, the gumption to, to send a letter to the developer telling them that they liked it, uh, that that was sort of more the exception than the rule. So it's nice it's nice now that the internet exists and you can actually see like um, like with the reignited trilogy for example uh, just seeing the fan response and seeing people on forums talking about your work uh, it's a lot more accessible now the relationship between developers and fans is much closer than it used to be which is nice yeah i i mean uh, especially with uh spyro with how uh, passionate the fans are for the franchise it must be it must be really exciting. I mean, I've, I've seen a couple of uh, videos where it's just like compilations on people freaking out, like on trailers and stuff. It's just like, oh, it's so awesome. <laughs> so awesome to see that. I'm, I can't imagine what it must feel like for someone like you who, who actually works on the game. Yeah, it's hugely inspirational during development too. When that happens, when you're, you know, you're starting to work longer hours and just seeing that people are anxiously awaiting uh, the thing that you're working on, it really helps. It's... Uh, Wind in the sails, as they say. So, going back to uh, Skylanders' development, uh, what would you say is the biggest change to how something ended up in the final version of the game? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, one of the things that comes to mind, I think it's been fairly well publicized that um, SSA was originally scheduled to come out uh, holiday season 2010. And so... Around February or March of 2010 is when Activision uh, came up to Toys for Bob for a visit, and they said, "You know what? This we really we think this is an important game. We think it's uh, we really want it to be the highest quality that we can make it. So we're going to push the ship date back to uh, 2011, and you guys are going to get an extra 10 months of." development like that was a that was a huge that was a huge moment for us it was it was also a funny moment for me personally because i had scheduled a, a wedding uh <laughs> september of 2010 and i thought it was going to fall after you know nicely after the development cycle but it ended up being sort of smack dab in the middle of that push to 2011 um but one of the things that that happened as a result of the game getting pushed to 2011 is that uh toys with brains as it were became a thing so if we had shipped in 2010 uh, the skylanders weren't going to uh, be able to store any information like nickname level upgrade choices uh and so we we really didn't have an elegant solution to that problem so you take your you know you take your uh, your your wrecking ball to your friend's house and it wasn't going to know kind of who it was without using something kind of awkward like we were talking about storing the information like on a Wii remote controller because I think there's a small amount of memory on one of those things. Oh, wow. So so getting that extra year, um, I think really kind of heightened the, the magic and kind of made it all come together. Just the fact that you place your Skylander on any portal around the world and that 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 particular console is going to know like about your unique Skylander. That was a that was a, a big change. And was the extra year the reason it was ported to Xbox and PS3 as well? Uh, which is to say, was it originally going to be on those consoles? Yeah. Uh, or at least at launch. It could have been one of the reasons. I don't remember for sure. Uh, I mean, it definitely. There's you know the the. Toys for Bob kind of had to figure out, had to finish the game before the game could be fully ported to um, those other consoles. So there would have been a, a delay for sure, and it would have been extra hard to do a simultaneous launch um, in 2010. So I'm, I'm sure that played into it, yeah. Could you reveal something, or maybe even a set of things, that was scrapped from the finished game? Uh, yeah, I could come up with a couple different items uh, in the category of just uh, naive developers of which I was one probably still am to some extent but the uh, the hub world in SSA uh, in 
we we talked about fairly late in the game. We talked about adding a uh, some some something called bumper turtles, where you could you could uh, pilot your own personal turtle in the water and, and kind of uh, bump into your friends, sort of in the hub world. And that was some of our more veteran developers at that time said, you know what? It's it's it, we're shipping in two months. What do you guys do? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, luckily, we listened to the, the wisdom there and uh, scrapped those plans. Uh, the I don't know if that, I think you already talked to Paul Ritchie, but mm. that early on we were talking about the the game having uh, procedurally generated levels. So he kept throwing around the uh, we, we're going to have a hundred levels in this game, and so you know we did end up. If you include the heroic challenges, we uh, there were quite a few levels, but we didn't have a hundred. So, and I, I think as much as there have been some games that have done incredible stuff with procedurally generated levels, like I think the handcrafted levels, Skylanders, it would have been a different, definitely a different feel to the product if we had gone that direction. Um, there, there's one a detail about uh, Trigger Happy. I don't know if this has been revealed um, outside of Toys for Bob, but originally that character his uh his internal co code name was the golden sheet uh he could not only could he steal gold from from enemies but the the projectiles that his guns would shoot would actually cost him his own gold so it's like this push and pull you could go around stealing gold from enemies but then in order to shoot them you were actually spending your own gold it's kind of like that ghost Rester thing i was telling you about earlier that was something that ended up getting scrapped because we really didn't believe people would uh would be into that or they, they would see the the coolness of that as a mechanic mm. uh so that that was a an interesting detail um golden sheet or i should say trigger happy um he wasn't initially going to be in the starter pack it's an interesting detail and we we were trying to remember i believe Boomer may have been a character that was originally slated to be in the starter pack. It's funny when I was talking to a few people this morning about that, and we're not even 100% certain that was the case, but it certainly uh, it, it was a late addition for us to put Trigger, Trigger Happy in that starter pack, and that actually led to some of the design changes. Some of his attacks changed um, at relatively at a relatively late time in the project. Were, were there always planned to have free in the starter pack? Yeah, I'm sure that there were a couple different options discussed. Um, I don't remember it ever being more than three. Uh, that 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 probably was a number that we we were happy with fairly early. Um, did you feel like it was the right number? Yeah, I think so. Look, it it gave you um, a good set of choice, um, and it it gave me. It gave me a good choice and gave me not enough to feel like, yeah, no, I need to buy more now. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was, it was just like, because I, I, I could see so many different possibilities from the the soul stones and the, the elemental gates, but with of teasing me, it's just like, oh, ah, that's a Skylander that looks cool. I want that. I don't have it. I'm gonna have to buy that, aren't I? Yeah. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> I will buy that gladly. What was your first purchase? I think it was Sonic Boom, uh, if I remember correctly. Because I remember, because I, I remember buying it because I was struggling on the final boss, or at least late game. Um, I do. I, I can't remember if I bought it specifically for the final boss, but I remember struggling a lot on the final boss. Uh, I made a video. It's probably still public, where it's uh, it's just a video on Sonic Boom, and it's the Sonic CD song Sonic Boom, and I just made a little edit with Sonic Boom <laughs> gameplay, just because I could. That's funny. Speaking of the final boss, uh, that was a funny moment too. Also, in the category of uh, a somewhat naive development team, uh, we uh, the final boss, as often happens, the final boss gets implemented somewhat late in the game. And uh, another thing that happened back then is we were so heads down, like I was so heads down working on Skylanders and getting the Skylander abilities polished up with our team. Um, but at one point I finally sat down and played the final boss and holy smokes, it was, uh, <laughs> it was, you know, as, as a developer, I had a huge stack of Skylanders at my disposal, or shall I say those, those little 
RFID chips. And I burned through, I, I hesitate to even want to disclose, I probably burned through dozens of Skylab oh, wow. and trying to beat them. And I, I remember getting up and going to talk to Chris Nelson and our QA team. And I think we, I think we made some revisions after that, but it was late enough that we that game definitely shipped with a much more challenging final boss than than we would ship with these days if we were to do if we were to do it all over again. And because of that, was there a fear with Giants that you'd repeat that mistake? Oh, I'd have to go back and play the final boss, but I'm almost certain that we did a better job tuning the experience. Yeah, <laughs> I, I do remember it being uh, a very fun, fair boss. Yeah, hopefully you get a chance to talk to Chris, because uh, Chris Nelson, he did a lot of those fights, and I'm sure he'll have some colourful details. Yeah, I'm hopefully speaking to him at some point. I'm, I'd love to hear uh, his experience with creating them and, and you know the various challenges that came of it. So, I guess... Uh, Similar to the last question, but a little bit different. Uh, what would you say is the weirdest or funniest thing that happened during development? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, the uh, one thing that comes to mind is uh, you remember that you could customize your Skylander with a hat, right? As often happens, uh, the first implementation of the hats, uh, the hats with buffs, right? They, they, uh, it was purely. Uh, Cosmetic, so you would equip the hat with the what appeared to be the biggest speed bonus. Uh, but uh, the the funny thing was, um, several people around the studio, probably everyone in our QA department, would play with that hat equipped um, well before the actual speed buff was implemented. So it was sort of like the power of suggestion. Uh, everyone thought they were going faster, but they actually weren't. And Interesting. That was, uh, Wow. You may ask yourself, did they ever implement the buffs? <laughs> <laughs> now, you said uh, some of the Skylanders had uh, uh, different in-house names. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, I could go through some of those. Uh, Wrecking Ball, this, this one was one of my favorites, probably. Wrecking Ball's uh, development title was the Force Field Grub. <laughs> Ghost Roaster was the Ghost Eater. Warnado was so. Some of these are just uh, logical, but they're they're funny and kind of endearing at the same time. Warnado was the sky turtle. Ash was the rock dragon, of course. Uh, Zook was Bamba Zooker. Slam Bam was the Yeti, of course. Hex was known as Shadow Maid. The uh, oh, another another interesting detail about the names, which I don't know if this is widely publicized, but. Uh, within the studio, we, we really felt like the Skylanders' names should be more like a a class, so to speak, like in the same way that Stealth Elf is sort of like, it's not so much a proper name like Brenda. It's like describing her class, right? She's the Stealth Elf. All the characters had names more in line with that initially, and then uh, actually someone at Activision had the... It turned out, I think, to be a great idea to give all the Skylanders proper names, which gave them a lot of personality. And one that stood out to me as um, that I really didn't like at first was was Chop Chop. And now I, I love that name. and I could never think of him as anyone other than Chop Chop, but we were calling him the Archean Elite. <laughs> it's a... Uh, it's just, it, it was funny because it was one of those decisions, you know, people always like to talk about, you know, developers versus publishers. Developers have all the good ideas and publishers just are there to, to ruin everything. Um, it's not always the case. There can be great ideas coming from from the publisher as well. And a lot of the names that, that they actually had input on a lot of the names that uh, a lot of them uh, ended up really sticking and I think really helping to give the characters personality. Um it, it, another interesting detail, uh, Archean Elite wasn't even the first name for Chop Chop. For a while, we called him the Pandoran Elite. The Archeans were previously known internally as the Pandorans, but then the movie uh, Avatar came out, and oh. we realized we couldn't call him that. Wow. Uh, yeah. Terrafen was the Land Shark. Stump Smash was just the Ent. Uh, Prison Break was uh, Gem Golem. Voodoo was the skull orc. 
I could go on and on, but that's a, that's a little sampling. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, I guess uh, I think everyone watching knows the answer to this, but uh, what have you worked on since Skylanders? <laughs> yeah, I've been at Toys for Bob the whole time, so uh, my my uh, life path has uh, is not surprising, right? So we did, yeah, we did giants then we did trap team and then we did imaginators and then we did the reignited trilogy and now of course i can't tell you what i'm working on yes of course right now yes, i wouldn't i wouldn't expect <laughs> but it's <you> exciting to. <laughs> my commission would have something to say about that yeah <laughs> so what, what was your uh, your role on uh, spyro reignited all right so i was the design director for that game so um honestly a lot of what i did was it, we really tried to figure out what the fans wanted in terms of, uh, you know, sort of quality of life improvements. What what were the things that we really wanted to stay authentic? Um, and then, you know, playing the content and just really uh, pushing for us to make it as polished as possible. We uh, it was we had to, we had to work quite hard to get to get those titles uh, to where we got them in the uh, given the development cycle that we had, but it was actually, it was a lot of fun. I've described that making those games to people and some, sometimes people say, well, that sounds like it wouldn't be that much fun because you're just having to re recreate someone else's idea. But when it's, you know, something that is such an incredible development team, like the insomnia t insomniac team, uh, the, they're great games and you really you get to know a game really well when you have to rebuild the entire thing and so you kind of get to, it, to a certain extent you get to relive you know a lot of the decisions that that they made in the original development cycle in the late 90s and it was cool being in touch with the uh the original team as well you know for some of those critical issues we were able to actually con reach out to them directly and say Hey, what should we do here? How should we handle this? And uh, that was really, really nice to kind of know that they were kind of rooting for us, even though they work for a different company. Well, I'm sure I speak for everyone when I uh, say uh, thank you for both your work on Spyro and Skylanders, because uh, yeah, they're uh, obviously very different franchises, but they're both wonderful, um, and I've grown to uh, love. Uh, the East franchise. I mean, I'm obviously, yeah, I grew up with Spyro, so I was obviously gonna love Reignited. But with Skylanders, I went in blind, and and I just knowing it was a Spyro game, but not really anything else. And I just absolutely loved it, and I'm sure that uh, oh, I say I'm sure. I know that loads of uh, loads of others uh, felt the same way, um, and loads of kids um, grew up with those games. Yeah, it's it's so wonderful to see uh, uh, how many. Uh, lives you've touched from your from your passionate work uh, over the years and yeah I just I want to thank you for that yeah thank you for playing you know um, hearing sentiment like that just makes us grin from ear to ear like knowing that people are playing you know it's hard work developing games and knowing that people play the games and uh, you know knowing that there's joy being created around the world by the work that 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 we do is the the greatest reward for sure um, it was nice too. I think it's, it was a really interesting uh, twist of fate that after we made Skylanders, which, you know, as is well documented, many of the diehard Spyro fans weren't, weren't that excited about the direction. They, they would have much preferred uh, a, a, a more Spyro focused game than Skylanders. And as we know, in terms of the cosmetics of the character, there were uh, everyone wasn't happy, shall we say. Um, so it was it was really rewarding to be able to go back and do the reignited trilogy and sort of do all the Spyro fans right and, and we appreciate it as a development studio the fact that the fans really at least most of them didn't seem to hold Skylanders against us they they uh, they quickly realized that we were gonna do our best to um, uh, make a great um, remaster of those great original games. And I guess uh, one final question for you. Uh, what advice do you have for aspiring developers? Sure, that's a great question. Um, and it's it's a great time to be an aspiring developer because there are free tools available on 
uh, on the internet. So like, da- I would say download Unreal uh, or Unity, um, or I'm sure there are some other great options. Uh, download those development tools, teach yourself how to, how to make the content that's in your head. You know, it's, it's really just a matter of, uh, there's plenty of instructional videos online. And I'd say that's the best way to get started. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, leave a like, subscribe, share the video around. I also have a Twitch, a Twitter, and a Patreon if you would like to support me and the channel. As you can probably tell, this is a massive passion project of mine that I've been working on for quite some time. And I'm really glad that I'm able to get it out to you. And I'm really grateful for you watching the video. If you want to see more from the series or other stuff that I do on this channel, click that notification bell to be notified when I upload next. But thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.